All right, mommies and daddies, I know you've been asking a million questions. I'm a mommy to four little kids <laughs> myself. And this man right here, Dr. Bradley, he's the medical director of infectious diseases at Rady Children's. He is going to make us all take a deep breath a little bit, right? Thank you. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. Okay, I'm going to sit down over here, uh, Dr. Bradley, because we have several different avenues of um, recording all of this. Thank you for, I know, I can't imagine how busy you are right now with what's happening with the coronavirus. Everybody in San Diego is very busy. So happy to spend this time with you. Everybody's looking for information right now. Yes. Dr. Bradley, I know you work closely with the CDC. From what I'm being told, you are like literally on the phone with them daily, weekly. Tell us what, hourly. You know, hourly. Tell us what um, you know as of today on Friday about coronavirus. So, so there's several levels of that question. In terms of epidemiology, in terms of how much coronavirus is in San Diego, which is of course local to us, information transmits very closely between the CDC, California Department of Health, and the San Diego County Department of Public Health. So, so they're all synced, we're synced with San Diego Public Health. And, and the press conference yesterday revealed that there were new adults that have been identified. So, so there's still no children in San Diego, our residents, who've been exposed to someone with coronavirus who've gotten the disease and, and are likely to transmit it. No sustained transmission in children in San Diego. That's, that's critical. And that's as of this morning, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. So it uh, could change at any minute. Uh, uh, we, we send samples to San Diego Public Health every morning from, from persons under investigation, the, the PUIs. They run them every day. We get the results back late that afternoon. So late this afternoon, if there's one of these children who were exposed to someone who was exposed to someone, we'll get that information back. Uh, we also send samples, and the pediatricians in San Diego County can send samples to Quest Labs and LabCorp, two commercial laboratories uh, based in LA County. And, and you don't need permission from San Diego Public Health in order to get that run. Those are commercially available tests. So those samples are all going uh, up to those labs. And of course, if they're positive, then public health gets involved because whoever's positive in San Diego County, the county public health officers and officials identify that case, identify all the contacts, put them all in uh, quarantine, and make sure if anyone gets any symptoms that they all get tested. That's a huge priority for the county. Isolate these these people and contain the spread. Okay. So the other thing that, that I, I can share with you today is that uh, Rady Children's Hospital and our Genome Institute right across the street has research links with other institutions in San Diego. We have a relationship with Scripps Research Institute and they're developing a big machine to, to, to test for coronavirus. You know, massive testing, thousands of samples. And so uh, Dr. Laugafarnas in our division in the Genome Institute has been sending over samples of, of nose swabs, the, the type that we get just to diagnose influenza and all the other usual viruses. But they've been taking all those samples and sending them over under, under research authority, goes to Scripps Research, they run them on their machine, and, and public health knows about this too. And so far, about 300 samples from kids with bad colds in San Diego are all negative, negative. We have no evidence of spread within children in San Diego County. And we're, we're to our knowledge, we're the only pediatric healthcare center in the country that has such research collaborations where we're actually doing surveillance because uh, the county of San Diego, while they'd love to do that, they don't, just don't have the capacity. They're saving their kits for people who have really high risk. We're basically looking at what's going on in the population. So I want to reassure you and other mothers uh, and fathers that so far we have no evidence. We keep sending samples, so 
between Rady Children's and Scripps Research, this is an ongoing project, so we'll be able to detect, hopefully at the earliest moment, when there's community-wide spread. Does, does that answer your question? It does answer my question. It brings me to one of the biggest questions that we have, because I know that we have the schools, which is a, a separate, whole separate little bubble here, that they finally today in San Diego County pretty much closed every single school district. But a lot of parents keep asking, are kids getting sick? Because the stats, like you're saying, nobody in San Diego, no, for as far as kids go, and that's kind of what we're hearing around the globe. There are some kids who have been diagnosed or have been um, tested positive for yes. coronavirus throughout the United States, but it seems like it's minimal. It's, Am I wrong? No. So, so you've hit on an incredibly important point. Um, People who are so sick that they need to go to the doctor and they get hospitalized, those are the group that we're now identifying that have coronavirus. All those kids who just have a cold and, and they're not so sick, they don't go into the doctor, they don't go to clinics or emergency rooms. We now know that, that, that coronavirus in children just gives you a very bad cold. So you all, know that now. We know that. We've, th the data actually came out from China, uh, uh, just being published, where they're tracking kids no matter how bad their illness is. So for the first time, we're getting a view of children with minor illness who are positive for coronavirus. And these kids just have a bad chest cold. So yes, kids are getting it. Uh, and yes, kids aren't getting seriously ill with it, otherwise healthy kids. Uh, but if you've got a cold and your kid's out there playing with other kids or going to school, then, then the virus will spread like wildfire. So, so this whole containment strategy of making sure kids don't contact other kids and spread the virus mm -hmm. is current public health policy. Um, because we know that kids that just have a cold with coronavirus, if they're allowed to go out and, and mingle with other kids and go to school, will be a source of spread. And once it spreads through the community, the children will spread it to their moms and dads, which, which is bad, but not so bad. But if it gets spread to grandparents, especially those with lung disease or heart disease or something, those are the cases that will be seriously ill. So we're trying to nip it in the bud. Has there been any reported fatalities with kids? No. Zero. Zero. As a matter of fact, in the United States, to our knowledge, no kids have actually been serious enough to even get the antiviral remdesivir through an emergency use program through the FDA in Gilead. How about that? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people are gonna take a deep breath. What about, one of the questions, Dr. Bradley, that I got quite a, a few times when I was about to start this interview with you is kids with underlying um, health issues, asthma, bronchitis, those who may have surgery, those who may have, have or are fighting cancer, whatever it is. What about those kids who have medical issues? That's a problem. I am worried about them. I keep telling you don't worry about otherwise healthy kids. I'm worried about our fragile kids. And, there's, and, and, and we've sent out a memo today uh, basically re requesting the doctors of kids who are fragile to consider taking them out of schools. Okay. We don't need to what take them fragile? out of this. Fragile. Okay. Uh, children with chronic lung disease, and, and this is a fairly small group of kids okay. who, who have... Uh, who've had problems with their lungs generally since infancy. Okay. Uh, on this floor of the hospital, we're on the fourth floor of the hospital, there are kids with chronic lung disease. Okay. So these are the kids that I would worry about, okay. cystic fibrosis, anything that causes chronic inflammation. Kids with heart disease. Okay. We take care of all the kids with congenital heart disease here. And the kids with holes in their hearts where the blood flows back and forth and floods the lungs, those are at increased risk. Car kids that get heart transplants, okay. and any kid that gets transplanted organs, whether it's a kidney, a liver, heart, you name it, bone marrow transplants for oncology patients, all of those kids who are transplanted are on drugs which, which suppress their immunity system. Okay. 
Anyone who's on a drug that suppresses their immunity system is at risk. Uh, so cancer patients, uh, we've got kids over in the Bernardi Center here, which is, which is a unit. It's like a nursing home for children. So, so some poor kids who are near drowning in a swimming pool or something, mm -hmm. and they come out very neurologically damaged, and, and they have feeding tubes. Uh, they're cared for at our Bernardi Center, and those kids are neurologically not normal, and they, and they sort of breathe in some of their secretions. So they're at risk, just like the nursing home in Seattle. Okay. So, so that's a group. Uh, rheumatologic kids who've got like lupus that are on high doses of steroids. I mean, I can go on. Asthma? You, asthma, bad asthma that's on steroids. So if you've just got mild asthma and all you need is an inhaler every once in a while, you'll probably be just fine. Okay. You, you may have more cough, mm -hmm. a little bit more trouble breathing. You'll need more uh, of your inhaler if okay. you get this virus, but you won't be up in our ICU. Okay. Another deep breath. That's yeah. good for a lot of uh, moms and dads. When you were on our show a few days ago, I had asked you about um, not having symptoms and being contagious. Yes. What have you learned from the CDC and has anything changed since we spoke? We know that this is being transmitted. They say wash your hands, eyes, nose, mouth. And there is talk of it living in the air for up to few hours. But if you're not sneezing and you're not coughing and you don't have a fever, could you have the virus and be contagious? Okay. So I want to answer all five of your questions. Were there five in questions that white in question? there? Yes. Uh, especially the one about the air. And I'll start on that one. Okay. This, this is spread by large droplets. So, so I'm talking to you. We're about three feet away. Uh, and and this, the CDC is now coming out with more confirmation that, uh, that, it, that coronavirus is spread by large droplets. So even if I, even if I were symptomatic, you would not be uh, infected by me. I would have to sneeze on you or cough on you, which I would never do. But, um, uh, and, and for that, if you were six feet away from me, you probably would not get infected. So, so, so how is this spreading so quickly then? Because kids sneeze and cough on each other. Adults will hug each other. Uh, someone sneezes on their hands, you shake their hands and then they, they rub their nose. So it's spread by contact um, very easily. Now, it's not spread in the air. So I want, it, I want you to feel comfortable that, that if someone walked behind us with active coronavirus, you would not get it, okay? Okay. Uh, it's all large. they sneezed right behind you? So if they were less than six feet behind us, then you and I would both be inoculated. And, and, and we would then, if we knew that they had coronavirus, we would go into a quarantine, self-containment. And, and if you or I develop symptoms, we would be tested for coronavirus. So, so that's, that's the public health policy, our Rady Children's Health policy that we're rolling out now. But uh, Wilma Wooten yesterday had said, and we'll get back to finishing that question, that not everybody in San Diego is gonna be tested for the coronavirus. No, and, and, and to answer that question, it would be wonderful if we had, if we had 20 million tests and we could test everybody in California. And so the concept is a good one, but we just don't have the tests. And we're ramping up, everyone's ramping up. In our hospital, we will be able to offer the test in just a couple of weeks. We've been in touch with a couple of different manufacturers. So, uh, so more people will be able to be tested. And so the, people, the kids with just a runny nose or adults, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, if you get a cold, then we will have the capacity in a few weeks to test you to see if it's just a regular virus or it's the coronavirus. And if it's, if it's a regular virus, we still don't want you to come to work, but it doesn't represent the same risk that coronavirus does. Okay, back so, to the questions about the Yes, virus. so asymptomatic uh, contagiousness. So if I, for instance, if I get exposed and, and I know three to five days after exposure, which is the usual incubation period, 
I begin to get congestion, runny nose, sore throat, muscle aches, some fever. Um, we know from influenza that you can actually detect virus a, f a day or so before you actually have your symptoms. So that concept, uh, which has been verified in coronavirus, probably also happens that you, you begin to be contagious just before you have your symptoms. But nobody really knows how easily spread the virus is. So we know the more virus you have, the, the more likely you are to transmit. So if I've got a runny nose, I've got millions of virus per every drop of mucus. It's horrible. But if I'm just beginning to get infected, I'll have very few viruses. But these tests that look for the nucleic acid of the viruses can pick up only one or two viruses. So it's much less likely that I'm going to transmit that to you when I have no symptoms. And on the CDC's phone call, the webinar yesterday, they, they said, and this is sort of community experience, we think that if you have no symptoms, you're not likely to be a risk to people around you. But when you get symptoms and you have coronavirus, there's sufficient virus there to really make you contagious. So. So you may be able to find virus, but you're probably not contagious. That's third deep breath. Yes. There are a lot of good yes. deep breaths. Okay, good information. Now to the symptoms. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're all on time change this week. And everybody's tired, and my throat was starting to get scratchy. I'm like, oh my gosh, could I have the virus? Will you know what is the first sign that you okay. could possibly have this? Okay, as as we talked about before. Uh, let me use influenza as an example. Uh, you know when you've got influenza. It, it, you, feel, you feel good one hour and the next hour you go, what happened to me? You begin, you begin to just feel bad. Uh, and, and there's medical terms for that where you feel bad, you know something's going, going wrong. You're not on the top of your game. You can't think about things. Uh, and so when you start to feel that way with, with flu, all the other symptoms come virtually immediately after. With coronavirus, it, it doesn't hit that hard. It slowly ramps up. So what you will have when you start off, and, and this is part of the, the problem, you won't be that sick. You'll just have a regular sore throat, muscle aches, uh, a little bit of headache, a uh, little bit of congestion, so you'll feel, you'll feel off, but you won't feel sick. Okay. As the, the, so this is the typical case, and obviously there's more severe and there's more, uh, and there's less severe, but the typical case, after about two or three days, uh, you begin to feel worse. Then you begin to get your cough, and you go, this is not going away, I'm feeling sick. And so, so many of the people in the United States who've been identified, uh, they, they seek medical care only after they've been symptomatic for a couple of days, and they realize this is more serious than they thought. And once they're identified with coronavirus, then everyone who's, who's been around them since they became symptomatic gets, gets quarantined. So three to five days into it, you begin to feel bad. <clears throat> um, and, and what I wish I could tell you is that there's a difference between a regular cold and coronavirus at the beginning, and I cannot tell you that they're virtually identical. So that's, that's bad news. No deep sigh, it's like still concern. And, and once we have more tests, if, if you've been around someone who's known to be uh, coronavirus positive, we can test you to see if that if, if your symptoms are from coronavirus. We have tests for 13 other respiratory viruses, mm -hmm. so it's not like we're flying blind. Uh, those tests are rather expensive because they're very technical. But we can actually see if you've got any of the regular common viruses. Are babies more vulnerable? We don't think so. Um, the data from China suggests that young infants, the ones that are actually more at risk of influenza, do not appear to be 
at increased risk of coronavirus. So when you talk about babies, so as a, as a pediatrician, there's the newborns who are like for their first couple months of life where their immune systems are just getting up to speed. We actually have virtually no data about newborns, so we always worry about newborn babies. But once you're over three to four months of age, from all the information we have right now, those babies just get a mild cold. cold. Yep. Okay. Um, how likely is it that you can have the coronavirus and not, they've said, we've had reports that there have been like people with no symptoms and when you say mild, like uh, that they don't really have much, they experience a very mild cold. How likely is that? Is it more likely for it to get severe? It's more likely for the person who has it to express symptoms okay. and, and say, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm feeling sick, I've got a sore throat, but, but as you know, if, if you were to take 10 people with a mild sore throat and you ask 10 of them, how do you feel? There'll be a couple who will say, yeah, I'm fine. And there'll be a couple who go, oh my God, this sore throat's the worst I've ever had. And then most everyone else will say, yeah, I've got a little bit of a sore throat. So, so when we talk about history, you know, what someone tells you, it, it, it's filtered through their brain and how they express yeah. their symptoms. So my guess is the people who said they had absolutely no symptoms, but were testing positive, probably had a little bit of something. So if you have a <clears throat> cold, at this point, just stay home. Yes. You don't need to go to the hospital, just stay home. Yes. If it gets to a point that you may have discomfort and you start to, when you say that this starts going in your chest and when, at what point do you contact your doctor or go to the hospital? Okay, so, so there's two parts of that question. Okay. Right now, when we do not have sustained transmission in San Diego, if, if you stay home with your cold and a couple days into your cold, uh, you begin to get sicker, it's likely to be just one of the regular viruses. And there's plenty of viruses around right now with this rainy weather that we're having, okay. they're spreading like, like there's no tomorrow. Uh, uh, if we have sustained transmission in San Diego, so if, if these tests on children begin to turn positive, so if you're at home and you begin to get sicker and you've been around sick people, and all of us have been around some sick people, uh, that's when you would go to your doctor and say, I'm sicker than I feel that I should be with this cold, and I know that coronavirus is in San Diego, uh, uh, could you please test me? And for most of the doctors and nurse practitioners in the clinics, uh, once we have sustained transmission, they will find a way to test you. Okay. So, but until we've got something here, the chances that it's coronavirus are like teeny. But even with the one community spread that was announced yesterday, that they believe it's from community spread? So they, so Dr. Wooten, sorry. No, you're fine. Dr. Wooten said that, that, uh, that one or maybe two of the positives didn't have an obvious contact. And so when you talk to someone, just, just say, oh, have you been to China? Uh, or were you on the cruise ship? And they say no, then you have to dig further. Mm -hmm. And what she said on the news conference is that the investigation is ongoing. So if it turns out uh, that they actually were at a party with someone who was on the cruise ship or there is a contact, that information will come out within the next 24 to 48 hours. Okay. So, so community spread is a concern, but until they've done their investigation, I'm, I'm willing to say we don't have community spread documented. So, so there are those that say, oh my God, if we don't have a direct contact, it's the sky is falling, it's community spread. Uh, we, we need to all run for cover. Um, and, and that's one way to approach it. And I'm trying to approach it more realistically and match my level of concern with the documented spread in San Diego. Does hu heat and humidity have anything to do with this virus? Uh, that's a great question. Transmission of viruses uh, is, is largely something that we don't understand. O other than large droplets, uh, we don't know exactly the role of humidity 
and temperature. We, every winter we know that people congregate together when it's bad weather, rainy, um, but it's more than just people getting together. There, there are atmospheric conditions. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who are investigating exactly what, what the atmospheric conditions need to be. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for coronavirus, it's for influenza virus, respiratory syncytial virus, all those viruses that are epidemic every year. So I don't have a good answer to that question. What about pregnant women? I worry about pregnant women. Uh, specifically for coronavirus, there is no obvious concern. There, are, there is n no information yet to show that pregnant women are at increased risk of severe disease or that the babies that are born to pregnant women with coronavirus, from what we know at this moment, are at risk of being infected through the mother. We are looking at that carefully. We know with influenza, pregnant women get more severe disease. So we're worried that as the virus spreads and we have more data on, on pregnancy and coronavirus infection, that it may be more severe. Uh, so I'm cautious. Uh, the babies that have been born to mothers with coronavirus who've been tested for the virus as they get born have all been negative. So we don't think that the virus is transmitted from the mother into the unborn baby before birth. But of course, once the babies are born, if the mother has coronavirus, we're separating them. And, and, uh, and on this CDC conference call, which is posted on the CDC site, by the way, for those that want to listen to it, um, we're, we're either isolating them or the mothers are wearing the full uh, protective uh, gowns and gloves and masks if they're going to be breastfeeding their babies. Let's talk a little bit about um, now that the San Diego's closed down schools, yes, there are some parents who are concerned about kids in daycare and some of these preschools that are not closed, and they're asking, do we pull our kids out of school, like the little ones? And that's a great question. So, uh, so let me try to match risk with public health measures. So once coronavirus is in the community, then there will be an effort to, to stop everything. So, so every group of children, that's more than 10 or 15 or 25, uh, will be asked to disband. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, even though there's no transmission in schools, the uh, public health department and the school districts have decided that the risk of a case popping up is high enough that they're going to cancel schools. All those kids go somewhere. It's, it's not like they're all going to stay home and the parents are all going to be able to take off work and stay home with them. So what, what we plan for, and, and the CDC's done this through modeling exercises, we've done it for swine flu and bird flu, all that sort of stuff, is where do the kids go? So if they just are all out of school, and they all go to the mall, they're still transmitting it among, amongst themselves. So, so the concept of preventing a child from spreading it to other kids is the concept that we're really trying to, to drive home. And once we get it in San Diego, which we don't yet have, then, then the measures will be uh, increasingly severe. But right now, the school closures is probably just the first step. It's out of an abundance of caution, as they keep saying, so that we don't have a problem. And, and that's, a, that's a reasonable public health measure. Are we going to have a problem? As we discussed before, every human is susceptible to this virus. We are going to have a problem. It's managing the problem. Uh, so right now, our, our goal is to isolate and contain. Uh, there will be cases that keep coming into San Diego County from, from all over the world, from other parts of the United States. Uh, so, so the problem is not going to go away until we've all been infected and are immune or until we get the vaccine. So. So yes, it's going to be an ongoing problem. And, and 
as we've shared, I think, during the summer, uh, as with most of these respiratory viruses, the, the other standard coronaviruses, which circulate every year, the disease activity drops during the summer, and then, and then in the winter, we'll get virus coming in from other states, other countries. I mean, it's around the world, it's a pandemic. Uh, and, and all you need is one case coming to San Diego next fall, and then all of this comes back again. Oh my God, is it spreading through the community? So we need the vaccine. I want to, I know that vaccine and the solution is a big question, but before you do that, some parents were asking, is there something that they can do to help boost immunity with the kids right now? Nothing will help elderberry and this zinc thing and drink more orange juice and... There, there is no medically validated way to increase your, your child's immunity. Just a good healthy diet, good rest, just make sure that they're healthy. That, uh, uh, no extra vitamins, no supplements, and I'm, I'll, bet, I'll bet you could find a lot of supplements that are being sold out there, <laughs> coronavirus. Oh, I read articles, drink yeah. more water, it'll flush the virus down yeah. your stomach and your stomach acid will burn it. Oh, that's, that's good. A good one. That's a great or one. drink water every 15 minutes because then you can wash it out of your dry throat. Oh, yeah, no, none of those are gonna work, sorry. <laughs> Vaccine. Yes. Tell me what you have heard, the latest and greatest, um, when will be the first opportune moment that we might have some relief, even a little from this? Medicine, vaccine, anything. Okay, so, so medicine is another question than yeah. the vaccine. The, uh, we know how to make vaccines. And as you recall, first during the swine flu epidemic, we had a vaccine within 12 months. It was, it was remarkable. It was the fastest development of a vaccine ever. And for, for this coronavirus, the, the sequence of the virus was made public um, last fall, and within one month, one of the companies already had a candidate vaccine that they were sharing with FDA. So, so for, for the moms and dads, uh, the way the vaccines are developed is that you, you, you get something from the virus that the body can recognize so that after you get the vaccine uh, and you get immunity, when the real virus comes, your body knows, I got this handled, I'm immune, you can't, you can't touch me, we're gonna kill you right away. But, but the trick is to make sure that what's in the vaccine produces the immunity that stops the infection when you get exposed to virus. So, so coming up with a candidate vaccine, you know, a, a little vial of stuff is, is technically difficult, but, but there are many companies that can do that, many in San Diego. Um, excuse me. When you then need to test that vaccine, and this is all done through the FDA to make sure that the vaccine is safe and effective, you need to test hundreds of people to make sure that they develop immunity. And, and for most vaccines, what you need to do is, is, to, is to use the vaccine in a group of people where the virus is prevalent to see if this is protective for real infection. So under emergency authorization, if the FDA can approve a vaccine temporarily, a little bit more early, if the vaccine produces uh, immunity to, to particularly critical parts of the virus, so that we know if you've got immunity to those parts, if you're exposed to the virus, you'll likely be protected. So, so the path which I believe will we'll take is that working with FDA, the FDA will do hundreds rather than thousands of people. And if there's a vaccine that looks safe and effective, they will give some early emergency release. So it goes into the public, they get more information, the vaccine manufacturer gives them information about side effects and, and protective immunity. And the FDA tracks all of that. And if the vaccine looks good, then they'll get a formal approval in a year or two. Uh, and, if, and if there's a safety signal, they'll pull it off right away. So, so to answer your, your part B of your question, mm -hmm. the vaccines will be going into clinical trials probably within the next few months, but it takes six to 12 months before the FDA will allow a vaccine to be released as, as probably safe and effective. The FDA does not want to release a vaccine too early because they don't want people 
exposed to something that can give you side effects mm -hmm. or, or that's not protective. So the FDA is between people that are screaming for a vaccine and then the safety people that say, oh, you know, don't give anybody a vaccine unless you know it's proven safe and effective. Mm -hmm. And so they're walking that time, tight, tight rope, fine line, to make sure that, uh, that a vaccine is released as early as practical and that after it's released, they track it very carefully. Possibly okay. this year? Th this year. Possibly. Uh, possibly. Possibly, this possibly year. by the end of the year, okay. more likely next year. More next year. And there'll be a couple of different companies that are going after it. Different vaccine designs. Okay. Uh, certainly traditional vaccines that are made the, the old fashioned way will probably be available within another year or two. Okay, and then medicine. medicines. Medicines. They, um, the clinical trials are underway, and again, this is part of what the CDC is sharing with doctors. Uh, there's one antiviral that was developed for Ebola virus called remdesivir. Uh, Gilead Pharmaceuticals makes it. Uh, full disclosure, I own no stock in any company that makes any medicines. Uh, and, and they are, through the FDA, are allowing their drug to be used for patients that have serious infection. So if we have a child in Brady Children's Hospital with a serious coronavirus infection, there is a path for me to follow. I contact Gilead Pharmaceuticals. They have a compassionate use program, mm -hmm. which, which uh, the FDA is allowing them to do, where I call them, I give them the case history of the child to make sure that the child really is sick enough to get it. And then through the FDA, they give approval for me to get the drug, then I get the drug and I can treat the child. And that will do? That will, that, sh that will we hope, shorten the period that the virus is replicating in the body. So if you've got pneumonia and you get treated, it, it helps make sure that the pneumonia will not progress, that you basically stop viral replication, the body heals whatever injury has occurred, and then you just get better. Could this be used on a larger scale? For sure. Grown-ups and kids and everything? And everything. Really? Yeah, but, but we don't know the toxicity. Okay. So let me make the analogy to Tamiflu. Yeah. Everybody knows about Tamiflu. Yep. So if you've got flu, you, you get Tamiflu. And, and generally, we don't treat people with mild influenza, and there are some which just get mild flu. But if you're sick, we're giving you Tamiflu. And that went through the entire FDA process of review for safety and effectiveness. So remdesivir is going to do the same thing. But right now, there, there are probably only hundreds of people who've been treated, not hundreds of thousands. So the information on how safe it is, injury to different organs, is, is not fully complete. So if I used it on a child, I would have to tell the parent, I'm not sure what all the side effects are. I'm going to be watching your child very carefully. I'm going to be collecting information for the FDA and for the company. And, and if I see something that's a side effect, I'm going to have to stop the drug. So far, uh, for all the people that have been treated, there's no huge side effect, which, which is hindering the use of the drug. And if there's one that comes up, you can be sure that the FDA will stop that compassionate use program. Family, this is really good. Are we good on time? We're still good? I'm at 30, 38 minutes. Yes, we're good. Um, for families that are, we got the grandmas and the grandpas and the daddies and the mommies, and now the kids are all starting Monday. All the kids are, are home. Yes. How are we safe if we're all in the house after a certain amount of day? Like when can we, when do we have to start saying, you know what, grandma, grandpa, maybe you need to go to this house and mommy and daddy need to go. How, how do we manage all that? So, so we've known for decades that children with, with colds that they do just fine with mm -hmm. uh, can infect grandparents who do, who do poorly. My mother had asthma and, and I would not want her to visit when my child, kids, had colds. And she would go, oh, well, I'm just coming for a day or two. It's fine. And, uh, and, and despite my warnings, and I'm an infectious disease doctor, she would come and she would just hold my, my son and kiss him. And I thought, oh my, what am I letting happen? And she would get really sick. Uh, uh, and that happens all the time. That, so beyond coronavirus, 
just have kids with colds not interact with grandparents. Kids who are healthy right now? Yeah, fine, fine. And, and the viruses that are around now uh, in the community, uh, not coronavirus, because again, we don't have community widespread that's documented, but for all of those viruses, it's likely that the grandparents have actually had those viruses before and are protected. Okay. So, so uh, and the grandparents should all get I influenza vaccine. So if a child's got influenza, then the, then the grandparents won't pick it up. So, so when the kids are at home, I would not recommend that a ch symptomatic child be kissed and hugged and all those normal things a grandparent does. Uh, and even parents should limit their, their contact. Asymptomatic child right Not now? a problem. Not a problem. I don't worry about asymptomatic children. I really don't. So my kid, if they don't have a runny nose right now, they you, don't have a fever, they don't look sick at all. Yeah, you can kiss them and hug them and grandparents can kiss them and hug them and not, and not really worry. And, and you'll have people to go, oh, well, but there's a chance. Well, yeah, there's a one in a thousand chance that they could be contagious. But, but let's, but, you know, we love our kids. And so grandparents, and I've got grandkids. I, I just love them to death. So uh, to, I want to limit exchange only if that's really necessary. Okay. Um, any other, your, your final, your final message, Dr. Bradley, to parents who are watching and are seeing this, and we have seen uh, a bubble of panic. Yep. The Trader Joe's, there is no more food to buy there. Costco, the toilet paper is gone. We have this balance of panic because people don't know what's happening, and then there's information on the social media, and yes. then... Uh, the the doctors are saying one thing, and then like Dr. Drew is Dr. Drew even a medical uh, doctor? I, that other doctor that said you all are blowing this out of uh, proportion. What is your advice right now to parents and families okay. today? So so everyone's looking at this from a different angle, mm -hmm. and this is the first opportunity I've, I've actually had to sit down and explain it all to to you. Yes. So. Uh, so you are a source of information that, that is up to date. So as of today, we have no documented sustained transmission. So parents don't need to worry as of today. They need to be alert and cautious. Things could change at any time. I don't want anyone blowing it off. Everyone's susceptible to this virus. So if it should, if it should come to San Diego, then we're gonna ramp up all of our activity. But right now, when you're when you're in a store and someone's got a cold, you don't have to worry about them giving you coronavirus. You have to worry about them giving you whatever virus they have, but not coronavirus. Um, you w will be looking at public health announcements. You'll be in communication with us. So if there's sustained transmission and if children begin to show up positive, then we change our stance, then we all get more worried. Our level of concern goes up, level of isolation goes up, we keep kids home more, we watch out for people with colds, coughing and sneezing. Uh, but right now, I want to keep people calm but alert. Is that, is that a message? That is a message. So the kiddos who are home from school for the next three weeks into spring break now, and moms and dads, I'm sorry, I have four kids and now at home, and I'm like, what am I going to do for the next four weeks? Do I take them out of the house? Is it okay to go to the movies? Yes. We, it is. It's okay to take them to the store, to the mall, to the movies. Yeah, if uh, d There's no sustained transmission. So I'm very comfortable going to movies. I'm going to go to a movie this weekend. I'm, I'm not worried. Um, but if this changes if, from the time that this podcast and this recording, then we're having a different conversation. Then we're having a different conversation. So if we're sending an, another sample of 75 nasal swabs over for the research test today, and if those are all positive, I'm not going to movies, I'm not going to the store, but if they're still all negative, I'm, I'm fine. My risk in San Diego is still very low. And in part, it's, it's due to our public health officials who are watching out for us. 
Dr. Wooten and her crew, uh, Nick Wyfentides, the, the doctor who's the chief medical officer, they're looking out for us. So it is safe in San Diego right now. Go to the dentist if you need to. Go to the dentist, yep. Um, if your kid is, has any other sickness, right? This was another question from parents. I even thought my kid might be getting a little ear infection, his little ears red. Yeah. It's okay to go to the doctor? It's fine. One it's of my fine. friends told me don't even come to the hospital today. What is everybody scaring everybody for then? Why is this so scary? Why are we, why are we being so scared? People are scared because the potential for the virus to come in San Diego is very real. Uh, if, we've got, if we've got hospital staff who've been in Seattle, who come here and they're supposed to work on Monday, they can't just walk in the hospital. Mm -hmm. We're checking to, make, to see what their travel history is <clears throat> and exposures. And if they've, if they've traveled to an area, they represent more of a risk to our Rady Children's community. And they will, they will either not be allowed to work or, uh, or be on daily watch so that as long as they have no symptoms, they can come. But if they develop symptoms after having been to Seattle, they're not going to be here to expose people. But the reality, Dr. Bradley, is San Diego is a huge city. It and is. We have people coming in and out. I mean, Ohio proclaimed last night that they believe that they have 100,000 cases in, in Ohio. I mean, I, I know that that's not a number that's tested. That's what their, their guesstimate. It's a model. It's a model. Yes. But when you see that, you think, look, there has to be somebody that got in from Seattle or people who are flying in from other countries that in some way was able to get in somehow to San Diego. I mean, how is that not a it, probability? It's going to happen. And I'm not saying that San Diego will continue to be infection free. But with all of these measures that have been implemented, so far, we've not seen sustained community spread. It is likely to happen. So I'm, I'm not one of these people that says, oh, it's not a problem. I don't know what everyone's talking about. It's a problem, but we're keeping track of it. And as we get the ability to test more, Shelley, that's, that's the thing. If we can test more, then all these people with respiratory symptoms uh, we can identify if they've got coronavirus and limit the spread. All of this is designed to limit the spread and until we get the vaccine. Limit the spread. Limit the spread. So cautious optimism. Until we know that it's spreading, you can basically do business as usual. But, but once we know it's here, then to decrease your personal risk and your family's risk, I'm not going to recommend that you go to movies anymore mm -hmm. once it's out in the community. Because if you're in the theater and there's someone coughing a couple, a couple seats away from you, once it's here, you won't know if they've got coronavirus or not. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't want you to get infected. You're too valuable, Sally, to be, <laughs> to be infected and off work. Dr. Bradley, thank you. Is there anything else that you want to tell any mommies and daddies to, to wrap this up? This has all been great information. And I think the takeaway from me as a mom, um, put aside as a news anchor who likes to bring information to people, but when I talk to you, I want to go home and order the biggest, fattest pizza and open a <laughs> bottle of wine and just and say, you know what, we, we are okay. And I'll be honest, being in the news, towards the end of the newscast, I'm like, somebody go buy some toilet paper. Like that's yeah. almost what you, what you feel. So it's important to hear this information from a, from a medical doctor. Great. Um, so if there's anything else you wanna say to us, we're listening. So we need to keep the lines of communication open with, between our hospital, public health, and you, because you're the one that's spreading the word and, and, the, and the public health people Press conferences are wonderful, but I think you probably connect with way more people. Uh, you've got credibility. And so, so if, if going forward, the, my last parting comment is basically keep in touch because things can change at any time. So I hope this podcast gets dated because even tomorrow, mm -hmm. if we've got community transmission, it'll be out of date. So they need to keep 
keep coming to you to see what's current well, that you day. You keep coming to me yeah. and I'll make sure that it gets out to everybody okay. else. Dr. Bradley, thank you. I Th appreciate it. Thank you very much, Allie.